All right, so welcome to another episode of Up, Up, and Aware. Um, we have another guest here today with us, um, Kat, Paul Jack. Um, and before we get into, like, the actual podcast questions and things like that, um, I feel like we have been friends for four, five, three to five years. When did we meet (laughs) (laughs) not too sure uh but before we get into the because we do have to do our first impressions of each other um but before we get into all that um thank you for coming on the show Um, we talked about this for a month or two now so i'm glad we finally got the chance to sit down and and talk and i get to pick your brain ask, ask you some questions um hear more about what you got going on which is perfect for, perfect for the show because that's kind of the gist of what the show is, is talking to different entrepreneurs, creatives, um, friends that are sort of constantly rising, kind of pursuing something or dream, a craft, a business, um, and kind of trying to figure out the awareness and how that played a part into your journey. Um, so I'm glad to kind of dive into that. Now, we do have a segment that is exclusive that will get to the spicier questions towards the end of the interview. Those will be on buymeacoffee.com um, slash standby studio. So that is four dollars to be a monthly subscriber that gives you access to all of the exclusive content. Um, I think there will also be another tier coming soon that will unlock new segments and new uh, content to be to be consumed so uh, definitely cat your drinker of coffee so buy cat a coffee um and support the show that way yeah buy me (laughs) lots of coffees love that i drink a lot of coffees way too many and do your coffees cost four dollars are they more over four dollars unfortunately what's the average like what is the cost of that coffee it's like six dollars plus you have to tip that's the thing you're not gonna not tip the barista like these are valued humans Mm, okay (laughs) all right well cat um i'm gonna try to say less ums that's what i realized watching the past few episodes so this will be my trial run i'm gonna try not to ask you questions (laughs) (laughs) yes i I will steer it back if we get too off track okay i think the mic needs to be a little closer i don't hear you as loudly is this good i think so okay so cat let's talk about the first time we met which i don't know if i fully remember i know the first time i saw you we went to school together it wasn't art of editing because you had a different teacher who did you have for art of editing oh i'm asking you questions i'm not supposed to do that (laughs) i had a a substitute teacher for like one semester um Mm -hmm. i don't remember her name i would see you in class or or like in our hallways and in the school you were a dual major a double major so you were in all of my film classes i came into school 2014 when did you come into school 2015 i think so 2016 that january did you transfer yeah okay yeah i came in uh january so that spring semester i didn't know anybody every by the time i came in everybody already had their friend groups and like clicks and people i had zero clicks so (laughs) (laughs) so when did what was your first film class that you remember taking um well i took i took a a class that wasn't a film class that was like creative practices and i made a film for it and once i did that then i was like hmm i think i'm gonna take a film class and i took image and performance with Kathy Rose, which Mm -hmm. is like a mix of different mediums. And I like used film with my performance work. And then my first actual film class was with Mike Addy. And I think it was just general like video production, which was like an elective course that other majors could take. But I was originally gonna be an illustration minor. Interesting. And then I was like, hmm. I like this 3D thing. (laughs) 
Gotcha. I wanted to like come off the page. I feel like all of the stuff that I was doing in illustration was like designs for things that I wanted to build and be like tangible. Definitely multidisciplinary. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was perfect school for that. So I I remember I don't remember what how we first met to be honest. I know I I saw you around. I knew you were a double major. I kept hearing your name around from whether it be from Mike, whether it be from faculty um, and talking about the work that you're creating and the, the dance and movement mixed with the film. And I remember seeing your film Glass Body. What year was that? Incredible Machine Glass Body. Incredible. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible Machine Glass Body that. I, I don't think I saw that for a while, but I kept hearing people talk about that film. Um, and I just remember you being sort of like the golden, like art, like the I experimental, like, like embodiment of talent <laughs> in our year for that. So, uh, and when I saw that, when I saw your piece and you won an award for the senior thesis show, right? Mm -hmm. What award was that? The Shannon D. Moore, I almost said a different last name. I was like Moore, <laughs> Shannon D. Moore, uh, major film award for, okay. that the school gives out. So that's even more credibility to the talent and the work that went into your thesis and your art. Well, I think it's. Can I respond? Yeah. I think it's interesting that you say like golden child because I actually felt like the black sheep like I feel like I was like like I remember okay so I only had like the th the second semester to make my thesis film and I came in to like pitch it to Wendy the like mm -hmm. head of the department at the time and Mike came with me and Wendy was like I like explained the whole like thing that I wanted to do and she was like well but why why, why do you need to make a film out of it and I was like it's always been a film I just have made the performance for this film right and like she let me doing it she let me do it but it was like I had to like persuade her that it was like gonna be worthwhile mm -hmm. and then she was like yes and Mike was like and I was like thank you Mike but <clears throat> I feel like without like my champions like Kathy Rose, who always told me, like, you have to know who to listen to and who to blatantly ignore. Because <laughs> it's just like, that's part of like what you don't learn is like, there's a lot of people who are gonna tell you what's what. And you have to know like, well, I'm gonna listen to them, but I'm also not going to listen to these people who tell me that like, what I'm doing is like, not the way things are done or not the way I should be going about it or you know, especially like I didn't have like all of those months of prep that the other filmmakers got, like building the budget to make mm -hmm. their film. And I didn't have a shot list at all. <laughs> so I wow. think like it was like I wasn't like consi I like think after I presented my thesis, then everyone was like, wow, like you're a filmmaker. But before that, everyone was like, what are you doing here? Like, mm. And I think, like, even, like, getting people to work on my project was, like, very difficult. And I felt very, like, not, like, exiled, like, on purpose. But it just felt like all the other, like, senior filmmakers were, like, helping each other make their work. And they were, like, you know, their pro his project's going to be so cool. And there was a lot of his, okay? Yeah. And... You know, when I would like, you know, in thesis class, when everyone would like show their projects, like everyone would be like, I would be like giving feedback to every single film. And then like m I would show like a clip of mine and it would just be like cricket, cricket, cricket. And everyone would just be like, <laughs> I have no idea what this is. Like, <laughs> I was like, OK. like. But you were in a my thesis class, right? You were I was in Mike's. OK. Yeah. I was in Wendy's. OK. Yeah. Which makes sense why I never really saw yeah. much of the work. Um, yeah. Yeah. So do you feel like... But I had made other films before that too. And I think a lot of people don't like to give me that credit. So I just want to say that too. But I don't think I've maybe seen any of the other ones either. 
Yeah, that's okay. I'll show you sometime. Okay. I don't, I think that's also, it's hard to be an artist and be a commercial for yourself as an artist. Like, it's very hard to, like, promote, mm -hmm. like, what you're doing all the time and be, like, shoving it down people's throats. Because I don't yeah. like to be that way. So, be, let's, let's rewind, because I want to talk about why you made that film. But before we get there, let's take a step back to sort of cat growing up were you like always an artist were you always artistic was this something that sort of came in later in life were you always did you always feel like a black sheep with the stuff that you were interested in i think like i was very like i spent a lot of time alone um and i read a lot as a kid and i like would write little like poems and stuff and I don't know I I just spent a lot of time like alone and I think when you spend time alone and you're not like you know when we were growing up there wasn't iPads and like there wasn't like I didn't have a phone until I was like in high school I feel like there was just like a lot of downtime to be by myself like with just my thoughts mm -hmm. and I think that like creates like a certain amount of like like you're never bored, you're always, like I was very much a daydreamer, I think, that's what I would say. And I would say that like, it's not that I, you know, didn't have friends, but I think that's because there's like a certain amount of like growing up like in a small town of like, you perform to fit in. Like you just yeah. like, you'd play the role that you are kind of like in, and like what else can you do? And then I think when once I left my town i feel like i felt like the possibilities for who i could be or like i don't know where what i could make like became more endless um yeah i don't know i think i was obviously always an artist i was always like in art classes and i definitely was like a loner growing up i didn't always like i definitely was not popular like in that like traditional sense of like the cool kids in school I wasn't like an athlete um I would like eat lunch in the art room or like I don't know I had like three friends like yeah I don't know I think I had really empathetic friends mm -hmm. and like maybe I shouldn't use that word but really like just a, a few solid like really good-hearted people around me and that was like who I hung out with and that was it. Um, yeah, and I I think I would pour myself into dance a lot as like also like escapism. It's always about escapism and I think like a lot of my work still like lends to that um, Wait, so you're kind of daydream. Back then dance was more of an escapism mechanism and even your work now is still sort of I think it all that. feeds into that. Like if, you know, you're in your room writing little like poems and daydreaming or reading um, or going and dancing, it's like all like a kind of escape in a way. And I think like that's still the way I'm creating is like I'm writing like my daydreams out. And I think that is still kind of like where it all comes from. I don't know. It's it's definitely like informed by what I'm like critiquing or what I see as like the like my critique of like how everything is like existing in our world, but it's like there's layers to it. And I think when like when you connect those layers, that's when it becomes like a full a full hmm something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to like be too specific. <laughs> okay. So I'm I'm thinking about the person I know now and I'm trying to think I'm trying to see what correlations were still there throughout your whole life or is this is just sort of like kind of who you are now, but my assumption is that cuz to create the work that you create you i feel like a person has to be uh in touch with a lot of different 
emotions, concepts, they have to like kind of have a, I don't want to say a dark mind, but like you have to sort of let yourself go to the deep ends of like things in, in the world and to then to come back out and take all those things and weave it into an abstract, like beautiful piece of art that is not cookie cutter, that is not generic. How like when did you first realize that you could like take all the thoughts and symbolisms and things in your mind and put it towards a project? Was that in college? Was that before college? I think that <clears throat> it's hard because it's like I don't I don't want to be like, you know, my childhood was so horrible or like say like all of this terrible you know stuff happened to me I think I feel now like I have lived many lives from many different points of view which isn't true for my, like who I am in this body but I think that I lost a lot of people really young and I think that I was very isolated because of my upbringing which like I think they're like my have amazing parents but I think there was strange things as a child that were problematic, I think. Like, I'll just say, like, I don't, I, like I said, I feel like I don't wanna make this like, I had a traumatic childhood, but I feel like it's worth saying that I was very isolated. Okay. Um, and I think that that also makes you very reflective um, and and kind of like, when you have time, you attribute meaning almost like you have okay. this the time and space to not only like reflect but like cherish and make things like sacred or like magical mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. so and when would you s and so you're saying that that was kind of something that was common for you growing up i think it just made like i just think the way that i like the way that I grew up made me extremely like introspective and I okay. think like I think the difference between who I was as a child and who I am now is I was much more quiet and shy and I was much more like like I would I think I would like sketch a lot and like I would just read a lot and it was less like I'm trying to make these ideas come to light and it was more just doing whatever I was doing like in the moment it was there there was less of a um like agenda okay. than like not that it's like very like I have to get this done but I am more like focused now in how I can take what I think is like not only beautiful but says something important and like combine that and 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 that's like I think just what I want to do in as like my passion in my life and I think before for when I was a kid I always wanted to be a dancer um, but I think there's a lot of like authenticity to using your form to like create something beautiful. And like, there's a lot of like, even though in dance a lot, you're, you're someone else is putting something on you. You're still able to like, kind of like come through that in the work. And it, it is still very personal because you're using your body. So I think mm -hmm. in a way, like I was always drawn to a very like I want to say like authentic way of making or like authentic way of like creating like artwork that I I don't know that's what I wanted to do okay and I think like when I got to school then I realized like wow <laughs> dance is very <laughs> I mean not that film isn't but using your body to perform and using your body to make money specifically is not for me. Okay. So while we're, cause I did want to transition into your thesis and you breaking that down a little bit, but before we do that, just for my personal, uh, being Gratification. Nosy, yes. <laughs> uh, did you feel in the dance department and or the film department that the people, the work that was being produced was kind of like mediocre and that like, not in a prideful way, but when you looked at other people, it was like, oh, like everybody around me is doing so much great work. I have to keep up or it's like, eh, like I'm kind of like already just a step above the average person at UArts. 
No, I don't I don't think still now I I respect so many people who are doing their thing. I think that I don't have I don't want to be successful in the way that a lot of people understand what success is. So I think for me it's just <clears throat> which is something also that Kathy really instilled in me who's one of my mentors. Um um and Kathy Rose is amazing just to shout her out everyone should look up her videos on YouTube. Um she's a amazing uh performance artist um that performs like with many mediums involved but um she always told me like you know you just it's it's that daydream like world that we both um so much make our work from and it's like no matter how successful or unsuccessful other people are they don't exist to me a lot like it's not that they that I don't care about them I actually like I care about so many people but I think that like in terms of like comparing it's very unhelpful for me to compare myself to other people I I try to just stay in my lane mm-hmm. and say I want to do this and people say well this is the way you do that and I say throw that away <laughs> I don't want to do it that way I want to do it my way and I don't really care <laughs> okay. Okay. I don't care about the way you're supposed to be doing it and I think it's not that I don't like I actually admire people who are able to like work in these industries especially women who I see working in these industries and being successful in the ways that they can climb this ladder I just don't want to be on the ladder I just like want to be like making my own like okay maybe it's not even going up like because I mean I think I'm just like going a path like I'm just going on my own path okay (laughs) but I think like it's not that I think like anyone's not I think in I think people are making amazing work I just think it's different than mine and it doesn't make it worse it's just we're doing two different things okay so going into your thesis film when I saw that I I was in Pete Rose's class experimental video and I did not like experimental work filmmaking I thought it was kind of just too like a bunch of people just took drugs and shrooms and they made a film about it and it's so deep that no one gets it and like you have to have been there to understand the plot oh my god and like a lot of this (laughs) I'm just like we're in a dark room watching one film for three hours and it's just like a one shot one take and all this stuff is happening and it's like this is so boring but it's like the point is that it is annoying or something like that. I'm just like, oh my God. Like you could have just told us that before we watched the three hour <laughs> movie. So, you know, I, I definitely was sort of more against experimental filmmaking at the start of that. Mm-hmm. I, I tried my best to understand it and get into it. Um, and I, by the end of it, I was able to appreciate it, you know, way significantly more than when I came in. Um, but seeing your film, I didn't understand it when I first saw it. And I think, talking to some other people i don't think they understood it either really so can you explain it and like sort of why you wanted to create it and sort of give us a quick description all right it's it's been a while since i made that movie my Mm -hmm. head is all on source architecture my new project Mm -hmm. but i wanted to respond before i explained (laughs) now i'm like what was i gonna say because i was like wow you really just roasted the hell out of experimental work but um (laughs) I I do I do say like in defense of like things that are extremely symbolic and hard to understand like it there's like you know not everyone is meant to read like a doctor's dissertation like right. not everyone is going to understand like the research and the layers that are going into like making something experimental and that's not to say that you shouldn't be able to make it accessible for everyone to be able to digest it but I do think at a like to a certain point like I don't need you to fully grasp a glass body to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. I do think that there's it's there it, there's a lot of stuff that exists in the mainstream that also have layers of understanding and comprehension. Like you can watch uh something and you'll get like some of it, but you won't get all of the layers that are underneath it, like all of the symbols that are behind it. I don't know. Right. It it's like so let me not get off on a tangent about experimental, but 
Glass Body, Incredible Machine. I did so I did the live performance first of Glass Body, and then I made the film Incredible Machine Glass Body, which I incorporated all of the archival, um, which I think like kind of just became like the glue mm -hmm. to all the performance components. Um, and it was essentially a culmination of all of my work through school leading up to that point, which is why there's like many small performance vignettes. But a lot of the <clears throat> performance aspects, all like the theme of the piece is not only like re-sculpting our like physical forms with these like extra pieces that we like are adding onto our bodies, which like also relates to technology, which is why like there is like a, a layer of like analog technology, but also just like actual phone technology mm -hmm. becoming like an extension of the body. Um, and it's it's about how we're we're all extending ourselves into this new form, this new like human form. And it's like all of my work is like kind of has this through line about um, how humans are evolving to become less human. Ooh, okay. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> so when I saw that, I mean, immediately I think everybody had the same reaction. It's like it's incredible, beautiful pieces of work uh, with just the creativity was just beyond what most people have seen in all four years. You know what I mean? Of, of school. <clears throat> and just executing that, like how was... Because I feel like that's you have to get really resourceful with getting the props and building the sets. So did it come out exactly how you thought it came out? Or would looking back, would you have been like, oh, I didn't, you know, achieve this look exactly how I wanted to achieve it? I, I actually just like was rewatching it because I have to like submit work samples for this like application for my new film. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to like select past work samples and I was selecting samples from it. And there's, you know, there's a lot of things that I look at it now and I'm like, oh, that looks like crap. Um, like some of the like filler shots that weren't as planned, I'm like, oh, okay, I would definitely be able to do this better now. But I do mm -hmm. think like what lended well in the end was like a lack of planning that like gave me the ability to play as I made it. And it it turned out somewhat the same as my intention, but also shifted a lot and I wasn't too precious with it. I said, okay, this isn't working, now it's different. Like, and it just, it evolves as it goes. And I think that always works well for me. And I think that's that's worked well for me as I have like started working in documentary. Mm -hmm. It's like, experimental and documentary feels very tied to me and improvisational dance too like they all feel like they have a very similar like way of thinking about building as you go and unfolding the story as you see it and like finding like I you know you have this I was saying earlier like you have the time and space to find meaning in things that you didn't see before and I think mm -hmm. as you like unravel something you don't know what it's what shape it's going to end up in but then you kind of like in you make the shape you see you see meaning as you go and then you're like oh this can connect here and you connect those dots and and it just comes together i guess okay but yeah it was Great honestly answer. a shit show <laughs> 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 it was like very scrappy but I, I i love the scrappiness i love thinking on the fly i love playing within making um yeah okay well, let's transition to the, your new film. We do have to, time is actually running away from us pretty quickly, which is the part that I hate about these episodes. So I didn't I wanna... even give my first impression of you yet. Oh, well, go for it. Okay. I feel like when I first met you, I was like, oh my gosh, this guy, he knows every camera accessory. I don't know, for some reason, like I feel like in school, you were like tech savvy, or maybe this is my like, not in with the film <laughs> kids perspective but like i was like kenny knows all like the technical like everything of everything <laughs> like that was not me oh okay that See? was nick and ryan okay well uh they were also categorized that way in my brain but and i connor, was just connor too. yes connor also amazing um but yeah i i feel like i just saw you as like 
make it, your your work is very i would describe it as super clean okay. which i don't know if that's the right word or how you would describe it because you make a lot of different work mm -hmm. but everything that i've seen from you it's very clean and i think i would say that with like sound too like the sound scape that is in your work okay okay yeah i think that's interesting uh yeah my my <laughs> going into you arts and that was i taught myself a lot so i don't know i just was never focused on the gear aspect as much as some of the other people were some people i feel like uh you know we we all came in with different goals and missions and not everybody what is meant to know all the technical stuff not everybody wants to like you know focus on certain things so yeah that's interesting when's your podcast i have a couple questions <laughs> <laughs> i don't know that's a good question like when are you going to be interviewed <laughs> i don't know we're we going to swap it next time <laughs> oh that'd be fun actually that would be funny so let's i i hate that we have to sort of go through this part quickly but tell us your new film what is what's it called what's it about and why you're creating it new film is called source architecture um it's about a cyborg who is obsessed with analog technology um so it's this weird mix of like ultra futuristic but also retro futurism um and going back and this need to go back and this obsession with old things um <clears throat> and just the past in general and the cyborg finds basically two old tapes um and each tape is like a small dance vignette that's like obviously ultra symbolic um one is a duet in the desert that is like finding each other and symbolizes like human authenticity and ritualistic touch mm. and <clears throat> the other tape is like a trio um dance <clears throat> piece that sorry um <clears throat> let me just start my sentence over mm -hmm. <laughs> the um other tape is a trio that performs together and kind of symbolizes like what's the word i want to say gluttonous um opulent gore <laughs> love that um, <laughs> was not expecting that but i love that so <laughs> yeah um the cyborg is kind of like the only speaking voice in the film and it's like a synthetic voice which i love um like a siri speak um mm -hmm. and she they it are basically reflecting on humans evolution to the point where she they it is at now have you seen like love death and robots i have seen a little bit of that that's some cool i haven't seen like every episode it's okay. pretty cool though yeah i haven't seen every episode either but there was this one thing that reminded me sort of loosely to what you just said about your piece which i think is super interesting i <clears throat> Remember, I think it was some point last year where you sort of went over the script and we were talking about your ideas and things and how it was just in conception stages. But now, like, oh, as the year or so plus have like went on, you've begun like you've started it, you shot some of it, you're funding it. Like, and I think I think that is super uh, admirable, I think just. Because it's not doing this a, a passion project on the side of living and freelancing and trying to figure out where we're going to live, like how to pay rent, all these different things um, to be so dedicated and consistent, I think is super is a great quality that you have. And I think the execution of it, too, is also amazing because I think there's a lot of people that do do do, but maybe the level of quality or 
maybe they do it too quick, too soon, and it, is, it doesn't kind of live up to the idea in their head maybe. But I feel like with you, you're like patient enough to do it right, but like eager enough and determined to get it done within a reasonable, a reasonable amount of time. And seeing the stuff that you shot in North Carolina and just the sample work, I think it's just amazing. And I'm super, uh, like, glad to be to be around you as you figure this out, because I think it's going to be amazing. I think Glass Body was amazing. I think Source Architecture is going to be amazing. Um, so can you speak to, with this piece, let's say everything goes well, you shoot it, you get it funded, it's done and out in the world why is, is this so important to you that like that you're sacrificing a lot of time energy money to create this thing um i think it's just always like even just like coming to school um and really like since since i had that first class with kathy um I just realized, you know, like, I, I think my my idea of success is just continuing to make my own work. And I think right now I have the opportunity to collaborate with a lot of talented people that are around me. So <clears throat> I'm trying to make something that I can use all of my talented friends and peers that I know um, and have them help me make this beautiful thing. But I think even if I had zero dollars, I would be sculpting in my backyard out of rocks <laughs> and I would make something that would be out of, like, I just think that I my the, there is no real agenda other than I just want to keep making my own work. And then, you know, it doesn't matter really where I end up. And I think that's part of like, I don't really like I have no desire to go to Hollywood or be in the industry in the way or in the sense that a lot of people think, you know, being a filmmaker, that's like how you be successful and that's right. how you can make money. And it's like, well, <laughs> I don't really want to be doing that. Um, I think I the artists that I see that I admire that I want to be like just make their own work consistently and maybe they don't make the most money but I respect them the most and I think they're the most well-rounded thoughtful caring um and I think it a lot of it is about like I I do just care about making it just because I think it's beautiful in a in a way that's not just like visually beautiful but I think it's like a beautiful thing to say in the same way that like why does like anyone write anything down and put it out into the world like why does like someone who's writing poetry like want to put that out I think it's just like you have something to say and you want to say it before you die <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm so dramatic but <laughs> but I really think that that's like all it's not it's not super like I need to make this so I can do this so I can do this it's it's more just like I want to make this because that's how I feel and this mm. is like what I'm thinking about and this is like what I'm passionate about and I love working with performers and I think there's something beautiful within film when you can capture like an ephemeral performance or something that like can never be replicated like mm. that is like something that I am obsessed with and I think in itself the obsession with what I make is the driving force so gotcha. it's just fun i think i just enjoy it that that's two questions about that uh you mentioned like your obsession to create it and like the feeling to get it out there in the world and like the what it I'm, I'm saying this wrong um essentially what kind of what i got from that is how do you act and do all of this action based off of feeling when feeling and emotion change and circumstances in life change you don't have money this month next month you do this like a feeling like that feeling must be so strong that it is it's strong enough to plummet like just plow through any and every obstacle which is extremely hard to do 
I think, because it is the escape. Everything that weighs on me, that makes me upset, and that like stands in my way, this is the escape. Like it's mm. it's still, this is why I can't sell out because then it's not enjoyable. And I think okay. it's still, it's just like reading a book. It is my escape. Like working on it is my daydream. And making that a reality just becomes part of the escape. Um, and so I think like, yes, I am very poor, but I think, <laughs> but I think like be, because I'm able, like, because that's the escape and not necessarily like, you know, having, I don't know, everything that is um, material, like in a materialistic sense, like it's like the, the sacrifice is worth it for the book. It's like it's it's the same as like an author writing a book, right? Like it's like it's still their escape. It's not just like so they can make money. I don't know. Mm. I think that it becomes separate from that. And then me making money is a means to to practice my escape. Wow. Very well said. You're making me realize things about <laughs> myself. <laughs> like, I guess that's <laughs> I mean you answer also, that immediately. So like you didn't you didn't even have to think about it so well i was thinking while you were talking okay. but also people are walking by and like distracting me. I know, you're gonna yeah. see me like huh like, <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> so uh when when you mentioned creating this before you die that's kind of transitioning to my one of my other follow-up questions which in the event that you die Sorry, this is getting a little morbid. We all die. <laughs> it's okay. It's like we will. We we all like are not immortal. Yeah, so. we all lose the game of life. Well, um, no, I don't think that's a lose. We talked about losing <laughs> and winning before. Be careful. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, so before. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, whoops. So what? What is the? Do you think about your work and your life as like legacy, like of things that you want to leave behind when you go, or, or is? It, I think of it as like, okay, if like humans are cell, like I feel like I am part of this species and like this is like everything that we are like putting out, including like our friggin' landfills are like our time capsule that is like left behind mm -hmm. and like maybe no one sees. It's also like, even if no one finds, it's like, it doesn't matter. It, it The point, it's like performance that while it exists, it is like miraculous and beautiful and impossible and alien and disgusting and amazing and then it's gone and that's what makes it like fleeting and perfect mm -hmm. because it can't exist forever or like it doesn't it doesn't matter who consumes it even it just matters that it was happening and that it happened i don't know maybe that's too like I think it, I think it's just like I don't it's not like I'm making this so I'm like people will see this and this is how they'll remember me like or or like that's not the it's not that that's the angle it's simply like I know that this is like what I'm supposed to be supposed to be doing or this is like just just what I want to be spending my time while I'm alive this that's really I think that's really what it is it's not about like the legacy after I'm gone but rather like what I can, what I want to spend my time doing. Okay, so let's say you you do this because this is what you want to spend your time doing. This is like your escape. And let's say traction starts to build, film festivals, people are hiring you. You're directing things, and you kind of start getting some like buzz. Would that then make what you're doing? more satisfying that you're being recognized for the work that you're doing or if you never ever got ex people aside from the friends and people in our community if no one else saw it aside from them would would that still give you the same feeling no you know see what I'm to say? It, no because see this is where i'm like i am ambitious because it it's great when when people recognize or or agree almost like they they're like oh i like that like okay great then that only makes it easier for me to make the next one. So it's always about just like, well, then I can, if, if, if I get like press or buzz or whatever you want to call it, clout, then I can make the next thing and I won't be as poor and I won't struggle as much to live in what I like to do what I, to live how I want to live, which is make what I want to make. 
<laughs> okay. So it's like So you're welcoming the buzz and all of that. That is like the the yeah, the motivation is like not to make money, but the motivation is to make the work and money makes it easier to make the work. So like gotcha. obviously like to be realistic like I think I am like a go-getter. Like I do work hard to like put myself in a place where I can make what I want to make, but which is really hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um and I'm not like oh, I can just, you know, make things and make no money and that's great. No, I would love to make a lot of money and then that would just make it easier to make what I want to make. And I, and I would also be able to pay people that I believe in and I would also be able to lift up the people in the industry who are often like overlooked or don't like have as many opportunities as these white boys walking around do. Okay. That's what I'll say. <laughs> like, I think like a lot of like working on my project, especially like one of my main priorities is not just like to make my own work, but also to like uplift like my friends and my mm -hmm. talented peers that are like around me that I know are fucking amazing yeah. and that do not get as many chances as other people. That's great. I feel like that's the best, you know, Going in with that mindset just makes it such a better welcoming environment where everybody gets to flourish, everybody gets to max out their talents and, and that's what they're there for and that makes everything a better product in the end and, you know, leading with that just, you know, compassion and just care for the people that you're working with is like the best part about sort of directing your own piece and, and having that freedom. So two other questions that I have before we get into the exclusive content. Um, so, and I just forgot them. Let me check real quick. <laughs> so with all of this that you're doing, that you have been doing for the past few years, hustling, freelancing, gig shoots, was the, is there, was there, or is there a moment where you wanted to give up? And if so, how did you not give up? <clears throat> Um, I think I did give up for a little bit, not gonna lie. After, I, after school? Yeah. Okay. I think, I think I was, I think I was giving up in a lot of ways and really? on, on myself, um, which I don't think is like that uncommon. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think what I, what I also want to say is like, it doesn't have to be permanent. Um, I think like, you know, I made my thesis and I was so excited. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to apply to all these festivals. Yay, yay, yay. Festivals are very expensive. Yeah. Um, and I applied to a few, but I but I really didn't know what I was doing. As I, I often don't, which sometimes is good because <laughs> I'm like doing things and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I do this like weird way of doing things and it works, you know, sometimes better because you're not like adhering to very strict rules. But not knowing about much about like festivals i feel like i just applied to like you know some random ones i got into some cool ones that i was like these seem cool even if they're not like the most well-known festivals it's like eco fashion film festival hell yes like love it mm -hmm. but got into these festivals right and then pandemic hits so didn't get to go to any of them which i think that really was like <laughs> it was just like it, that wasn't what what got me though that was like just disappointing but okay I think then just like with COVID and I had to move home I had to leave the city <clears throat> I had to leave the city and I it's it's like hard to put my finger on one thing that did it but I just kind of lost hope that that I was going to be able to continue making my own work in a way that was like, that was fulfilling. I, I was bartending, which was really hard. Um, and I was saving up money, which in the end did work out, but it's really hard while you're doing the hard thing mm -hmm. to see the, the light. And it's really hard to get out of dead end jobs. Um, yeah. It's really hard no matter how much your brain has a passion to work on other things like being someone who you know has to work a really tough job that weighs on your um 
your mental health a lot, I think. And I, I've worked a lot of tough jobs. Um, I worked a lot of tough jobs during school. And I think just like not knowing the step between where I am now and working in those jobs, it was very like, um, what's the opposite of encouraging? Discouraging. <laughs> I wanted to say disencouraging and I was like, I'm so close yet so far. But yeah, it was, it was, I don't know. And honestly, I think like Mike, one of our professors brought me on to do sound for Penhurst. And like then eventually, like after I like talked to my talk, like they like, you know, him and Nathan, who's the co-director on the project, like wanted to bring me on as like more of a producer role because they like liked my ideas. And that like gave me a lot of confidence. Um, and it also like allowed me to start getting small sound gigs. And right before that had happened, like I wouldn't have been able to take that gig if I hadn't just up and quit my bartending job with no plan. And I think a lot of the times it's like the risks that you take that are really scary that you're like, okay, so I had I had saved up a lot of money. I was living with my parents. I had just moved back to the city. I was still bartending, still saving money. And I was like working at this place and they were just like very misogynistic. Like I had clawed my way into a management position. Mm -hmm. So I had like gotten to the top. I was like bartending manager, couldn't go really any higher. And they still just treated me like such shit. And I just, one day I was sick and I called out and it was like the first time I ever like called out like day of. And they called me and yelled at me on the phone. And I was like, I'm giving my two weeks right now <laughs> on the phone. I was like, I'm giving my two weeks. And you know, I'm very like professional. I'm very like, I don't burn bridges, but mm -hmm. like, I was like, I will do my two weeks, but you are not gonna speak to me. Like I'm not, I'm not doing this. Nice. So. I quit that and I think that was the beginning. Like I, I just had my one day a week teaching job and I was just like, I will just survive off of like very little money, no coffees. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and I and I just like took the risk and like, I feel like Mike brought me on for sound for Penhurst, and then I just like started getting gigs from there sound wise. And then, yeah, I don't know what else happened. Things just, fell into place I was always working on source though you know that's the thing even when I was like giving up I think I was still like writing this thing and I came to Josh like my producer and like told him about it and he was like yeah like like I don't think you should like because I was like you know like whatever I don't know maybe I'll just make it like very low like I was just kind of downplaying myself and and what it could be and what like my capability like could grow to be as an artist and I was just kind of like I don't know I'm just like writing this and I don't know what I'm gonna do with it and he was like I don't think you should downplay yourself and he said something like very similar to that and and that just kind of like was like oh like let's just not let's just <laughs> yeah. not like think that I'm not good enough to make something ambitious and I think like having another person though to come and be like I believe in you and I want to work on this with you that like shout out to Josh really helped me too and like both that happening and getting that first sound gig gave me a lot of confidence and that confidence was like key in me just like pushing through all the like self-doubt and just being like I'm just gonna make this movie I don't care that is that is actually pretty amazing to hear like th that story and just like knowing how hard you work now and just kind of hearing how, about how you how hard you're working a while ago. like when was that so when did you quit bartending versus when like you started to work with mike and get more gigs so i didn't quit bartending i so i when did i start it is july 2023 mm -hmm. i quit bartending november 2021 wow not so, that long ago so like a year and some change and freelancing is hard freelancing is not for like the faint of heart like the s mental stress and how you have to compartmentalize your life and your expenses and oh my gosh like that is n like anybody who's doing that everybody knows anybody who's not doing that like 
you know. <laughs> I have all, I feel like also like one of the things they don't tell you, like when you first start freelancing is you just have to pretend that you already have been doing it, which is what everyone does, but no one likes to talk about, I think. Mm. And it's like, I have been, oh my God, I went on this one shoot. It was a shit show. I just did not have like the proper like caliber of equipment. And I was like, wow i got my ass handed to me and it wasn't even like no one was mad at me like it right. wasn't even like my fault it was like just like that's not really what we need and i was like <laughs> great but that's what i have so i think like what also like has helped me like persevere and be really like you know just take it as it comes and like just kind of like you just adapt 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 and like roll with the punches and literally get punched <laughs> I think like I was I was thinking about this the other day like I was like yes I was super like anxious on that shoot because I was also like I traveled for it and I was like so like I felt so unprepared but I was just like I don't have that equipment um but and it wasn't even my fault it was, like, wasn't properly like yeah. communicated it was no one's fault but I feel like growing up in dance I I so I my parents didn't have like a lot of money for me to be like in these high-end dance schools growing up so I was like at the community center doing dance classes until I was like 13. 13 I was like mom please like I really want to like get serious like please like let me go like somewhere with like some more intense training. So I went to this one place um and the woman like after I like auditioned she was like I don't know where you've been dancing I don't know what you've been doing but I don't think you should dance ever again. Wow. And I was like, and I just like, I, I was like 13 at the time. So I like held it together and was like, and then my scrawny ass like walk out <coughs> to my to my car where I was getting picked up. And like, I just sunk down in the street, in the seat and just like cried like so hard. And it was just like, after that experience, and like, I still kept dancing. After that, I went on to like, train through high school and like caught up to all my peers who were had been dancing the whole time in that like training and like then I went to school for dance like so it mm. it's just like that taught me like don't let anyone like get you down especially if someone's like in a specific ser scenario and you're like because you know when I get upset I'm like very easily cry like, mm. so I'm like don't fucking cry like you hold it together after that woman yelled at me like I swear like other thing like men telling me like you don't have the right equipment i'm like well and like i'll go in my hotel room and like cry my eyes out and be like that was so embarrassing right. but like it's like there's nothing i can do like in the moment yeah. while i'm there so it's just like okay i don't have the right equipment like what can we do to solve this like how can i like make a workaround for today because like this is the equipment i have that, like yeah. and you just act like you are like fine with it and like that is what these white men do every day every day <laughs> I, th I think that's hilarious, Kat, that story you told. But I think that's such a similar experience of freelancing. Like moments where you show up, it's just you and your camera, you and your gear, whatever. They're like, oh, can you do this? Like, like, like that's not what I was tech. told. That's not like, you know, what we discussed or whatever the case was. And then you just sit there. M plenty of times I'm just sitting there like. <laughs> like i'm You're a like, failure i i'm not like they'll never call me again this is my last job freelancing exactly and i'm like the world's gonna get around that i'm not prepared oh my and God. like everything just like goes in slow motion you're just like frozen no 100 percent. and it's like terrifying but it's like that almost happens every shoot every not every other shoot like it's very rare that i go on a shoot that i've it's like everything goes right like they love it like yeah you know but that's just my mind thinking about the worst case but normally they don't even know that i messed up or they're they don't even care that much they're just happy to have somebody show yep. up and do work and be nice and kind so that's the thing it's yeah. like the at the end of the day be kind you know hold it together don't stress anybody else out yeah. that's a huge thing on set yeah like, don't stress people out i mean like listen when i'm back at home it's like all stress <laughs> but, like, but like while you're there you're just like everything's you know what it, whatever it is what it is and you just yeah. like it's that like you just got to hold it together i guess i don't know yeah, it, it's but it's i won't pretend that i'm like you know 
I don't know. It, it's really hard to freelance. It's really hard to like break into stuff like that, I think. And it is a lot of like you just you act like you deserve to be there yeah. and then you do. Yeah. And I think we have to transition to the exclusive stuff. We have like 15 minutes left, so we have to do like quick answers. Quick. But before we transition, I did just want to circle back to what you said about Josh and like having that person there to tell you to not give up. Mm -hmm. And it's like wild how one person could say one thing at one time and that be the thing that keeps yeah. you going, that keeps people moving forward. Yeah. And Mike too. My, yeah. And there's like looking back, there's so many people that support in such ways that you think are insignificant at the time. But then you look back and it's like, wait, you just said I can do it. And I didn't really think about it at that moment, but you said it, you said it, you said it. Mm -hmm. Oh, your piece is good. I like your work this and that, this, that, and the third. Um, and just the ac accumulation of just th those small feet, positive feedback and friends giving you support really is like crucial. So I just wanted to highlight that because um, that I feel like that was a very important thing. So that's, and that's great that you had Josh around and Mike and everybody else. So, so this is the moment where we switch over to the buy me a coffee section. So if you're watching, this is kind of where it cuts here. Um, and I actually do get coffee from this. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't, you, there is a way you can donate coffee and then there's a way you can buy subscription. So a subscription gets you the ex exclusive content. Otherwise you can just buy cat of coffee just through the link itself. I haven't fought anyone, but I have a feeling like I would be, I would be scrappy. And does that, does that make you work harder? It does make me work harder. It makes me like love more too. I purge my emotions a lot. And I think crying is one of those things that like, I'm a crier, I will cry. My priority is making meaningful work to put into the world to connect to other people and make them feel less alone. And also just like connect to my people that are around me and make them feel as loved as they make me feel. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kat, for coming. Thanks, Kenny. I, I feel like if we had another two hours, we could be here for another two hours just talking. We're going to get into your childhood trauma next <laughs> on the next episode. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, we'll figure that one out. Sprinkle it in. We'll yeah, we'll figure that one out. Um, let everybody know where they can find you quickly. Yes. <clears throat> My website is www.ragebox with two X's. Dot com and my instagram is also ragebox with two x's um and that will probably send you to all the right links anyway so okay awesome thank you again cat for coming on um yeah well I, th there's a bunch of reoccurring people that i feel like will be on here so i feel like you'll be here again as well so we'll see on the I next episode yes <laughs> we have to i feel like cat we have to come up with a, a different segment for this these podcasts which i think we could brainstorm and i think that would be a great way to bring people back to do like a new segment or like something else that's ex that's exclusive as well something fun something creative so we'll, yeah. we'll think on that cool all right <laughs>